It's the year 60 BCE. Rome, which will go on to become one of the most influential nations in recorded history, sits at a crossroads. In the east, Pompey the Great has defeated the southern Greeks and is wresting control of the entire eastern Mediterranean, while Gaius Julius Caesar pushes into modern-day France. These two men will go down as some of the brightest military minds in the storied history of Rome. Their conquests will transition the dominant power in the region into a true empire with complete hegemony over the majority of the Mediterranean and beyond. The Roman Republic, like all good republics, was built with a system of checks and balances in order to prevent one figure from taking total control. But by this point, Pompey and Caesar have teamed up with Marcus Crassus in an alliance used mostly for personal gain. As Rome becomes a force as dominant as Europe has ever seen, these three men will break those checks, and a republic will become an empire. In a specific, abstract way, college sports reflects that republic. No one team or program can be too good in theory, so checks and balances are installed to keep things that way, like forcing great players to leave after four years and giving every program the same amount of scholarships to offer. At best, it's proven to be a relatively patchy framework, and more than two millennia after Pompey, Caesar, and Crassus, a similar alliance born of different ideals will completely alter the college lacrosse landscape. In the grand scheme of Syracuse lacrosse, there is probably no development as singularly significant as this one. Like many true watershed moments, the setup is nearly a decade in the making, and like so many great stories, it starts with a bob. It's the summer of 1978. Bob Allen has a perfectly awful haircut, completely befitting a man dubbed, without a doubt, one of the flashiest stick handlers of all time during his playing days. Bob is the head coach of the Canadian national team, preparing his group for the World Lacrosse Championship later that summer. At the moment, though, he faces a unique problem. A Canadian rule dictates that before any government-funded team can represent the nation abroad, they must play a game in front of the Prime Minister. For practically every sport, where grassroots initiatives develop from the bottom up, this isn't a major obstacle. But despite originally adapting lacrosse from the Haudenosaunee, Canada has been exclusively a box lacrosse nation for nearly half a century, and Allen coaches the national field lacrosse team. This is only the third World Field Championships ever, and there just aren't any field teams walking around in Ontario or the rest of Canada. Bob's gotta find somebody to scrimmage with, though. He has no choice but to look south and seek out the closest big U.S. college program. Roy Simmons Jr. gets a phone call, and Alan pleads with him. Get a team together and come scrimmage us in Ottawa. There are multiple factors working against this. School is out, SU has just finished a successful but grueling season, and there won't be any monetary compensation for the three-hour drive up. But if anyone can scrounge something together, it's Junior, who started his coaching career pulling volunteers from campus. That's exactly what he does, rounding up students, heading north, and scrimmaging the Canadian national team. After it's over, and with the last hurdle before England cleared, Alan tells Simmons, I owe you one. Junior laughs it off. You're Canadian. What are you going to do for me? That can seem mean-spirited, but Roy had a point. There were a few Canadian trailblazers in college lacrosse in this time, guys like Mike French and Stan Cockerton, but for the most part, Canadian box and American field were incompatible, separate ecosystems. Junior didn't help out expecting any kind of reward, even though it wasn't a move well received by his compatriots. He did it because, above any school or even any country, Roy Simmons Jr. serves the game of lacrosse. 
The US team, stacked with All-Americans, had yet to lose a game in any of the World Championships, and the Canadian upstarts, outside of French and Cockerton composed almost entirely of box players, were humiliated by the Yanks in the second group game, 28-4, on the 4th of July no less. After defeating the Australians to earn a title game rematch, Canada came into the second meeting with a new strategy, trying to shrink the field and make the Americans play their game. It worked. Canada only trailed by two goals when Jim Wasson scored. The Americans, believing the ball never crossed the goal line, completely fell apart, and Cockerton notched the tying goal and double overtime winner. This is lacrosse's version of the miracle on ice, and it almost single-handedly revived field lacrosse in Canada, a massive development for three children halfway across the world. In one of Canada's odd geographical quirks, the city of Vancouver is not located on Vancouver Island. Instead, the capital of the largest island on the west coast of North America is Victoria. It's here that two pairs of twins are playing every sport imaginable as their parents desperately try to burn off their energy. If one pair of twins picks up lacrosse, so does the other, even as young as four. For young lacrosse players in Victoria, there is no greater attraction than the Victoria Shamrocks, the local amateur box team. And in 79 and 83, the Shamrocks captured the Man Cup, the National Amateur Canadian Championship, established in 1901. As one of the sets of twins turned 11, their father, having never played lacrosse himself, realized that he had coached them as far as he could. But he knew some players in the Shamrocks and convinced Canadian Lacrosse Hall of Famer Ron McNeil to tutor the twins. McNeil did much more than tutor them, emphasizing critical thinking, meditation, but most importantly, the ability to analyze one's own game and, in essence, train oneself, technically, physically, and mentally. In today's hypercharged world of amateur athletics, that seems commonplace, but in 1979, it was revolutionary. By this point, the popularity and investment in the field game generated across the country by the 1978 win led to the establishment of all-star youth field teams, including one in Victoria that traveled across the West Coast. Even now, it's clear these twins are a cut above the rest, and they're certainly destined for stardom in the box, but their field future is much murkier. Not because they aren't good enough, but because college lacrosse, the next step in the field game, is exclusively along the eastern seaboard. No one at this time is crazy enough to look for talent on the west coast, let alone the west coast of Canada, and even if they wanted to, no one has the travel budget. It seems these diamonds will be tucked and hidden a continent away. It's sometime around August of 1984. Things have changed for Junior and his program, having famously won a national title the year prior and come three goals shy of repeating in a rematch against Johns Hopkins. The phone rings again in his office. Six years on from Roy's favor, our old pal Bob is on the other end. Earlier in the year, Allen had coached his team in a special lacrosse championship during the Olympics in LA, and a pair of teenage twins tried out for the event. They didn't make the cut, but Bob believes they can excel in college lacrosse, and he's already talked to them about playing for Simmons at SU. The famous story about this goes that Junior offered them sight unseen, but he himself has contradicted that. Alan told Roy the twins were playing in a box event in New Brunswick, and invited him up to come meet them. When Roy asked how he would know which players to look for, Bob simply said, you won't miss them. This phone call, sometime in the summer of 1984, is this program's event horizon. The shifting of the calendar. Year zero. The old Syracuse, the heroic upstart. It's in the past now. We've crossed the Rubicon. Welcome to the Gate Era.
Gary and Paul Gate give off an aura. Everything about their being seems intentional, as though they were designed for lacrosse. At six foot two and 210 pounds, but with unnatural speed and explosiveness, able to outrun stronger defenders and exert their will on smaller ones. Even their upbringing seemed precision engineered, popping up at just the right place in just the right time to adapt to two variations of the sport that had grown completely independent of one another. In box, where shooting angles and passing lanes are much smaller, the Gates not only mastered both skills, but became comfortable operating in the tight, enclosed spaces. Now, on the field, they were given the time and room to use their athleticism to beat defenders one-on-one. -on, -one. on top of that, the tutelage of Ron and the Shamrocks supplemented the Gates with a thoroughbred lacrosse IQ. The name Gate has the same status in the lacrosse world as McLaren or Ferrari. Congrats, Roy. You get to walk out of the dealership with two. There wasn't a more fitting coach to land those keys than Junior, whose famously open style gave Paul and Gary the freedom to express their creativity to the fullest extent. Where in the field game, the ability to effectively use both hands was paramount, Box rarely afforded the space to switch hands. As such, the Gates were mostly limited to their dominant left side, but were so skilled it often didn't matter. Why use the time and space to switch hands when you can dart a pass or rifle a shot behind your back? Practically all American coaches at the time would bench a player for even trying that, but Simmons openly encouraged it, and like in many other areas, Paul and Gary proved the behind the back was not only flashy, but incredibly effective when used properly. Opening passing lanes, defenders had no idea existed, and catching goalies off guard. The Gates were more athletic than you, they were smarter than you, they were more technically proficient than you. College lacrosse had seen nothing of their like. This isn't to say the Gates immediately took over. As was common practice in Canada, the brothers took a gap year and got jobs in Victoria. Then a late rule change that required them to take the SAT delayed their arrival in central New York further. In the end, Simmons first walked into practice with his Canadian prodigies in January of 1987, when starting spots were mostly cemented. Gary and Paul spent most of that spring adapting to the American game and college lifestyle while receiving spot minutes here and there. Of course, the Gates only represented two of the six starters on offense, and in the span it took them to get to SU, the Orange were tasked with replacing the production of both Brad Cotts and Tim Nelson. Luckily for Simmons, Mike Messer and Wes Genesee had answers. Todd Curry, the last great product of Messer's second wave, earned one of his two first-team All-American selections in 1986, and 87 brought the first star of Messer's third wave. John Zolberti left West Jenny with a record 361 career points, 85 wins, and one loss. Junior plugged him in right away and asked him to replace possibly the greatest ex-quarterback in the sport's history. All that Z-Man, as he was affectionately known, did was score 74 points, as of 2021, the most ever by a Syracuse freshman. Nelson left huge shoes to fill, but Zulberti and the orange chucks he rocked while playing were well and truly up to the task. 1987 served as more of a transition year for the program than 86. Even while playing in four fewer games, Zolberti's per-game production dropped off, and the Orange pieced together an 8-3 regular season. But in May, merely four months after arriving in the U.S., things began to click for Gary Gate. In his first NCAA tournament game, Gary scored six goals, breaking SU's single-game record. In his second NCAA tournament game, he put five past Cornell, breaking SU's single tournament record. Gary was receiving random playing time with the first team at attack, but was still otherwise a third-line midfielder. In his first 10 games, 
he had eight goals. In his final three, he had 17. World, meet Gate. Despite Gary's efforts, the Big Red took a hard-fought victory, 18-15. As a despondent Simmons walked off the field, the twins came up to him. It's not that they didn't care about Syracuse, but they were still foreigners here. As they put it to Junior, this wasn't their country and it wasn't their championship. But in seeing how hard their coaches and teammates took the loss, something clicked together in their minds. Right then and there, Gary and Paul promised Simmons that as long as they were at SU, they'd never lose another championship. In fulfilling their vow to Junior, Gary and Paul led just the second three-peat in NCAA history, a club that has only welcomed one other program in the 20-plus years since. SU was only bested once in 42 tries during this period. From their sophomore year onwards, the Gate brothers came one goal shy of perfection. But beyond that, the manner in which Cuse dominated stands out even more. It's tough to define a close game in lacrosse without full context, but if we set the cutoff as five goals, then of the 42 games SU played in this period, 11 count as close. Let me put that to you a different way. SU and the Gates blew out their opponents just under 75% of the time. In total, over the three seasons, the Orange outscored their foes by 393 goals, almost 50 more than the other two three-peaters. And where those other dynasties were mostly defense first, the Gates and Cuse put up 762 goals during their run. In that famous 1983 championship game, SU's 17 goals were tied for the second most by a team in any title game at the time, the Gate teams scored 18 goals per game for three straight seasons. Statistically speaking, this three-year period is the most dominant run in the modern history of college lacrosse. Two separate events after the 1987 season sparked the Gate dynasty. We already know of the brothers' promise to Simmons, but the second change would begin one of this sport's true legends. For the idea of making it in field lacrosse from the west coast of Canada, John Crowther broke the sound barrier. A few years older than the Gates, Crowther made his name in 1983 when the Shamrocks lifted their second Man Cup in four years, winning the MVP award in the process. A few months later, he made history again when he signed to play at Rutgers, becoming the first person from Victoria to play Division I college lacrosse. By all accounts, Crowther was incredibly well-liked and possessed a passion to mentor the next generation in Victoria including the teenage twins that would set college lacrosse alight a few years down the line. But on September 29th, 1984, Crowther was caught in a love triangle, and a vengeful ex-boyfriend fatally shot both him and his girlfriend. Gary, who had worn the number 10 his entire youth career, immediately switched to Crowther's old number. When he arrived at Syracuse, that was taken, so Gary wore 38, then after the season ended, asked Simmons if he could receive Crowther's number next. John Crowther was 22 years old when he died. Gary Gate made sure no one ever forgot him. Let's talk about Gary Gates' 1988 season, his first with the number 22. 
The chart you were looking at shows every instance of a SU player scoring seven or more goals in a single game in the NCAA era by the time the gates arrived. It's a very rare occurrence, happening on average less than once a year. Against Colgate on March 23rd, Gary became the 10th member of this club. Three days later against Army, he scored eight, then in April, put seven past Hobart. Only one other player has ever had a year with as many such games. By the end of the regular season, Gary had matched Tom Corey's program record of 56 goals in just 12 games compared to Corey's 17. With a good tournament, the NCAA all-time single season record of 65 was well within reach. This brings us to the 1988 quarterfinal versus Navy. Syracuse won the opening faceoff. Gary brought the ball up and passed to Paul, who immediately set his brother back up to rip one from 13 yards out. The single season SU record was now officially broken 22 seconds into the game. The Orange won the next faceoff. Gary brought the ball up and passed to Paul, who instead snatched his defender's ankles and made it 2-0 35 seconds in. This is what the Gates did to people. Any kind of attacking transition, a key to Simmons' style, just needed to find one twin and wait for the magic to happen. 20-yard shot? Goal. One-on-one -on -one matchup? Goal. Face-off win? Throw a behind-the-back pass, draw three defenders, create a one-on-one -on -one matchup? Goal. Get in a man-up situation? Make the defense wonder why they're even trying. Well, that's the end of the first quarter. Gary has scored four, Paul has scored two, Paul has assisted all but one of Gary's goals, and Gary has assisted both of Paul's goals. The scoreboard might as well read Gate Brothers 6, Navy 1. I mean, on this play, Navy number 7 is so concerned with staying by Gary that he sags off Paul, and that's a shot well within range. The very next possession, Paul lines a shot up, Seven, who just saw Paul sting this in the corner, closes out hard, and now you're in an and one mixtape. On the very next possession, Gary splits a regular double team with ease and ties the NCAA tournament record with his seventh goal of the game. This contest is over. The bench players come in, and it looks like we are firmly in garbage time. It often went this way for the Gates. They so routinely ended games in three quarters or fewer that they rarely played in the fourth. Junior once said that had the games been closer, the Gates would have shattered every NCAA record. Today though, there would be no space left to wonder as Junior sent the Twins out for one more shift. This game makes no sense. An entire collegiate lacrosse team was outscored by not one, but two players on the other team. And for just over two quarters, it wasn't particularly close either. In the 236 games SU had played in the NCAA era, seven goal games happened around once every 15 or so. The two brothers would accomplish the feat in the same exact contest is incredible. It's not as though Navy was a pushover either. They were seventh in the polls coming into this, a tournament game. Even to top 10 teams, the Gates were simply playing a different sport. As of 2021, only three players in the history of the NCAA tournament have matched Gary's nine goals in a game. Just two players in Syracuse history have as many in any game. In scoring his 20th tournament goal, Gary had already become the all-time career leader in such goals at Syracuse. Tom Nelson, the only other Orange at that point to have over 15 career tournament goals, needed 10 games to reach his career tally. Gary Gate passed him in three. I have never seen anything like this. Gary finished the 1988 season with 70 goals, a mark that, as of 2021, remains Cuse's record by 14 and has been exceeded by just six players in NCAA history. Of those six, 
All but one needed more games to do it, and the lone exception was part of a 1978 Air Force squad that played just three Division I teams. Gates' goal scoring was seismic. You can see its effects in the players around him. Zolberti had 25 more assists in 1988 than 87, which made up the difference between a second-team All-American and an attacker of the year. As far as the top 15 seasons in NCAA history go, Gary has the single highest per game scoring rate. You can absolutely argue that his 1988 campaign is the most impressive goal scoring season in the history of college lacrosse. It was now official beyond any reasonable doubt, Gary Gate was the king of this world. So a coronation was in order. It's the second quarter of Syracuse Penn, and thus far, the visitors have used a tight zone defense to keep the orange offense in check. Down 2-1, Gary Gate receives the ball behind the cage and leaps. This goal has no comparison. It lies beyond the conventions of the sport in a way that makes its introduction irreversible. Junior compared it to the first dunk in basketball. That the moment Gary chose to unveil it came in a Final Four game is a testament to Junior, the only coach who would ever even consider something like that down by a goal in the tournament, especially considering no one on the team even knew if it was legal. The refs had to delay the game for an entire minute to figure it out, before ruling that the goal stood, a decision the NCAA would later reverse, banning goals of its like for nearly 30 years. This goal was fire, stolen by Prometheus from the gods on Mount Olympus. It would later be named after the only contemporary in American sports who could rise into the stratosphere in such a manner. This is Air Gate, a goal destined to be alone. It remained that way for about 20 minutes before Gary did it again. Yes. Gary Gate had just annihilated NCAA scoring records. Yes, Syracuse had just put together an unbeaten championship season. And yes, Zolberti had one more year of eligibility while the Gates had two. How could it possibly get any better? Tom Marachek was going to be a baseball player. It was sometime in the mid-70s. Tom was around seven and was playing in the backyard when his older brother got home from work. Billy, who would later suit up for Team Canada, took Tom's glove and chucked it over the backyard fence. Tom Marachek was going to play lacrosse. Like the Gates, Marachek grew up watching the Shamrocks in Victoria. Like the Gates, Marachek played and excelled in youth field teams. And like the Gates, Marachek possessed an immense natural talent for the sport. But unlike the Gates, Marachek never found his way across the border. It wasn't for a lack of effort. The Gates had tipped off Simmons about their buddy back home, but for whatever reason, the finances just never lined up. While the Gates were busy bulldozing college lacrosse, Marachek was roofing in Victoria. By January of 89, Tom was preparing to enroll in a local community college when, at the very last moment, Junior found a way to bring him to the Salt City. Paul, Gary, and Zolberti all repeated as first-team All-Americans in 89. Gary and Zolberti repeated as the best midi and attack in the sport. And all Marachek did upon joining that trio was break SU's freshman scoring record and come this close to another first team selection. It was just an unfair assemblance of talent. These four players scored 165 goals in 1980, an average of 11 per game. Once again, 
they laid waste to the field. They scored 15 more times than in 88. They poured in 13 in a quarter against Rutgers. In the first round of the tournament, against who else but Navy, Paul and Gary executed a hidden ball trick that fooled everyone so badly, Paul pulled up from near midfield to score. A lineup of this caliber can only have one moniker, like Airgate, stolen from its equivalent in the basketball world. This was showtime. Nobody could stop it. Almost nobody. It just had to be Johns Hopkins. What started as a pesky title game upset had morphed into a full-fledged war for dominion over college lacrosse. That 1983 championship was the first in a trilogy of Q's Hopkins battles, and only a shock overtime upset prevented another matchup in 88. Things are different now. There's no flamboyant speeches at team banquets, no heroic blue sky to orange sunset plotline. Stylistically, you could not have drawn up a better matchup. In complete contrast to Syracuse's free-flowing creativity, Hopkins idealized discipline, structure, and defensive solidity. Over the course of the season, SU's core four had outscored the entire Jays team, but Hopkins possessed a super weapon of their own in Dave Petromala. Petro could match the gates physically. He could match the gates athletically. He could match the gates in technical prowess. He matched the gates resume as a three-time first teamer and two-time defender of the year. He was even a lefty, allowing him to take away Gary's favorite shooting angles. Widely regarded as the greatest defender ever, Petromala was every bit of a lacrosse demigod as Gary was, and by Gary's own admission, the only man on earth who could stop him. Petro even beat Gary to the Enters Award in 1989, a decision hard to argue with as in the season opening matchup between the two teams, he held Gate a point and a half below his season average, as Hopkins took down the orange for the only loss in the Gate era. Through the first half of this title fight, Petromala again shut down 22, keeping Gary off the score sheet entirely. It was clear that if SU was to pull off a win, they'd need someone else to lead the charge. We haven't given Paul as much of the spotlight as his twin so far. That's no fault of his. Gary just absorbs the spotlight like nobody else. Gary has 22. Gary has the record-breaking seasons. Gary has the air gate. Paul had a different role. He was the more all-rounder, the better playmaker, the better outside shooter, but was every bit as talented as his twin. Whether Simmons told him beforehand or he just knew instinctively, this was Paul's moment to put on a show. Off the opening face-off, Paul immediately went to work, attacking his defender, cutting inside, drawing a double team, rolling back, and scoring with his weaker right hand. First blood to Cuse, 19 seconds into the game. After Hopkins answered, a defensive breakdown gave Paul a shot that might as well have been automatic. And later in the quarter, Paul trailed into the space Gary created by drawing two defenders and launched a missile right in Petro's face to complete his hat trick. A goal from Zolberti and composed behind the back from Marachek with time winding down gave the Orange the first quarter edge but a 4-0 run from the Jays in the second was only broken up by Paul's fourth goal of the half, another bomb from way outside that made him responsible for two-thirds of SU's total. To open the second half with the eyes of college lacrosse solely on him, Paul Gate casually unleashed a 30-yard dart on the run, behind the back, without looking, right into Greg Burns' stick one of the most relentless defensive teams ever, only saw the ball in the back of the net by the time they turned around. You'll have to go far to find someone who does not think that is the single greatest pass in lacrosse history. 
Still, the Jays maintained a slight edge throughout the second half, having an answer to every Syracuse run. As the third wound down, Gary finally scored on an extra man opportunity, but again Hopkins responded, keeping the lead going into the fourth. After a quick score by Rodney Dumson, 22 beat Petro on a ground ball, got the angle off his first step, absorbed a ferocious check, and calmly went five-hole against goalie Quint Kessenich while falling to the turf. You could throw the kitchen sink at him, but when the moment called, Gary Gate always picked up. Q scored twice, and Hopkins scored once as the clock ticked down, and SU had the ball up 13-12 with a minute to play. By all indications, Q's could run out the clock, but Petromala pulled off the seemingly impossible when he stripped Gary with 30 seconds left. Hopkins would get one last shot, but the Orange D, often overlooked and led by Pat McCabe and goalie Matt Palum, made the stand. Many call this the greatest title game in lacrosse history, a true clash of titans, and the Gates had come out on top. No, they were not perfect, but for three years, 19 and 22 in orange beat every single team they played. For his effort, Paul was named the most outstanding player of the 1989 tournament. John Zolberti scored just four fewer points in his career than Tim Nelson, the man he replaced. He has more career points than Gary, Paul, and Maracek. He was the second four-time All-American in Syracuse history. He was the fifth player in the NCAA era to be named Attacker of the Year two or more times, has more points than all but one of them, and is the only one not in the U.S. Lacrosse Hall of Fame. If John Zolberti isn't a Hall of Famer, there's no point in having one. Paul and Gary are now seniors. By the NCAA's rules, they have one more year of eligibility left. It might feel as though this story is already written, but the final chapter will reach heights we have never seen, before or since. This chart shows every qualified Division I scoring offense since 2002. The further up a team is, the more goals it's scored. The further right a team is, the higher its scoring rate was. The average for this sample is around 11.5 goals per game. Past 13 per game, and you're already in the top 15%. At 15 goals per game, we're in the top 2% of all seasons this millennium. There's the first two years of the Gate era. There's 1990. 13 games, 271 goals, 20.85 goals per game. It's preposterous. The teams of the prior two years, led by the same Gates, broke the 20 barrier about 26% of the time. In 1990, that number jumped to 77%. This included the first occurrence of a team breaking 20 in each of its games in NCAA tournament history, and the highest scoring performance in a championship game in history. The 62 goals SU scored remains fifth in NCAA tournament history. It is the only team in NCAA history to ever average more than 20 goals per game, and the all-time record holder in that category by more than two per contest. It is, quite simply, the most potent offense in the history of college lacrosse. More than 40% of that goal-scoring production came from Gary, Paul, and Maracek, the three Canadian sensations rewriting the record books in those orange mesh jerseys that are among the cleanest looks of all time, one Cuse never should have gone away from. They are the first triumvirate of Syracuse lacrosse. This is their empire. Oh. You see the asterisks, don't you? Let's talk. Did you hear about new USC football coach Lincoln Riley, who signed a contract this offseason that's rumored to be worth $110 million? The same USC that Reggie Bush won the Heisman Trophy with in 2005? The same Reggie Bush that allegedly received around $300,000 from two marketers? 
an act which the NCAA considered improper benefits, the same improper benefits that would eventually be found to be a violation of players' basic economic rights and that were only relaxed after involvement from the American Congress? Here's the deal. In 1995, the conclusion of a two-year NCAA investigation found that Simmons' wife Nancy had co-signed a car loan for Paul Gates' wife Catherine. The NCAA declared Gate ineligible and vacated both his statistics and the 1990 championship. They didn't give the title to the runners-up, they didn't erase or invalidate any of the games, they just removed Syracuse's name. According to Simmons, no payments were made, no money exchanged hands, it was an independent decision made without his knowledge. Sure, he's the coach, it's not like he's going to say, you got me, but Junior was not the hothead his father was. He always kept his cool. After this ruling, he called the NCAA a puppy dog without a leg to stand on. I have never seen or heard him this impassioned. This is the NCAA though. Their say is final. No matter how much Junior protested, they put that asterisk there. Athletic director J. Crew the Mel eventually relents and makes the trip to the Dome to hand the trophy back to the NCAA. He can't find it. The vacated 1990 championship trophy is gone. As of the making of this video, 31 years later, it has never been seen again. Naturally, Simmons was the first one questioned about this. He strictly denied any and all, no, I'm just kidding. Junior openly said the trophy was with friends of Syracuse lacrosse. The 1990 banner still hangs from the rafters of the dome. SU still recognizes it in all of its media branding. That asterisk will be there, and it's your choice to recognize it or not. But in a way, it almost seems perfectly fitting for this team. Everyone in this sport tried to stop them, and everyone failed. So the sport itself tried too, and they failed too. Theories abound about the whereabouts of the lost trophy. One, that it was buried under the dome floor, was recently disproven through the recent renovations. A documentary made about the trophy in 2015 concluded that the most popular theory, that the trophy was buried with Roy Sr., was unlikely. But when asked again in the documentary, Junior admitted that were the NCAA to ever reverse the decision, the trophy could be found. It's out there somewhere. So concludes the Gate Era. 42 victories, 1 defeat, 3 championships. 283 goals, 139 assists, 422 points. Two careers, the likes of which this campus has never seen again. At Syracuse, Gary is untouched when it comes to goals, holding the program's career scoring record by 37. To this day, only Maracek is even in his universe. He nearly doubled the postseason goals record, and has the two highest scoring tournaments in program history. His 66 postseason points remain the most in Syracuse history. He retired one goal shy of Stan Cockerton, pivotal in the 1978 Canadian side that brought field lacrosse to him on the all-time leaderboard. Since then, five men have surpassed both of them. All of them are attackmen. In fact, every one of the 35 leading scorers in NCAA history play attack. Except one, our boy Gary. Three players in Syracuse history have ever had three straight seasons with 65 or more points. Tim Nelson, Paul Gate, and Gary Gate. They stake as much of a claim as anyone to the honor of greatest Cuse player ever. Painting the Gates legacy as purely wins and records would be disingenuous though. They were titans, making the fields of horrified opponents their stomping grounds, all the while elevating the notions we had of what this sport could be. Simmons saw in them the same qualities that earned Irvin Johnson the name Magic. 
Lacrosse in the 80s was much like the NBA in the 70s. When Magic was drafted, his immediate creativity and innovation captured an entire generation to tune in night after night. And so many people noticed the NBA was launched on the trajectory that led to its worldwide influence today. Something unimaginable on those winter nights in the Forum. The year before the Gates arrived, the Dome averaged just over 2,000 fans a game. The 1990 team drew over 11,000 on average, most of whom left when Simmons took the brothers out. In the 1988 championship, held at the Dome, attendance surpassed 20,000 fans at an American lacrosse game for the first time ever. The legendary 89 final between Hopkins and Syracuse drew nearly 24,000. Cuse and Hopkins were the Lakers and Celtics, Gate and Petromala, Magic and Bird. Then, the dream of lacrosse reaching both coasts, 40,000 fans packing into football stadiums on Memorial Day, and thriving professional lacrosse all seemed like pipe dreams to the Simmons, Lions, and Browns of the world. Without the Gate brothers, who knows if the sport ever gets there. There is but one story left to tell. July 22nd, 2006. Gary Gates' professional career mimicked his collegiate one. That is to say, he did it all. In box, he's a six-time NLL MVP, twice as many as second place, 14-time first-team All-Pro, and three-time champion. On the field, He's the reigning MLL co-MVP and a three-time champion. He won two Minto Cups with the Shamrocks back in Victoria. He's already in both the U.S. Lacrosse Hall of Fame and the NLL Hall of Fame. Everything there is to win, Gary Gate has won. Everything except this. This is Gary's fourth world championship. He had been named to the all-world team in each of his three prior trips, but each time Canada fell short. In 1990, they fell in the final to the US. In 94, they didn't even get that far after losing to Australia. And in 98, next to Paul, Maracek, and the generation of Canadians they inspired, Gary nearly led one of the craziest comebacks ever, only to fall short in overtime. Gary has already announced that this will be the final game of his career. One last shot at the Americans, on home turf, in Ontario. It's early in the fourth quarter, and the contest still hangs in the balance with the home side clinging to a one-goal lead. This isn't the Gary Gate we know. At 39, most of his game-breaking athleticism has been sapped away by Father Time, the 220-pounder we saw at SU is now closer to 260 and playing attack. So far, the Americans have pretty much shut him down. But as Dave Petromala learned 17 years prior, Gary decides whether you stop him. No exceptions. A fortuitous ground ball gives Gary the inside angle, and nobody is pushing him off his spot near the crease. Canada leads by two. Two possessions later, he finds time and room on the left wing, a shot you could bet your mortgage on and still get a good night's sleep over. Canada leads by three. The Americans are panicking. Canada's defense is holding strong. John Grant Jr., who has taken Gary's role as Canada's best player, overpowers seemingly half the U.S. defense to make it a four-goal lead. The U.S. has to force the issue now sending the goalie out to double Grant and make him pass it. He does, to Gary, who spins away from his defender in a way few 39-year-olds could, and gets his hat trick. A few minutes later, after Canada runs the clock down more, Gary rolls inside to his left one last time and puts a bow on his career. As Gary's teammates, many of whom grew up idolizing him, applaud, Gary lifts the one trophy that has always eluded him. 28 years after the seismic upset that sent him on this trajectory, and 22 years after that fateful Team Canada tryout, he has slain the final dragon left in his way. 
Gary Gate is the closest thing this entire story has to a singular protagonist. Not by a degree of his success, however unprecedented it may be, and not by virtue of his status as the sports goat, even if you think such honors belong anywhere above Twitter fights and YouTube comments. There's something more abstract in his story. How else do you explain his decade-long journey to Syracuse? How else do you explain the air gate? How else do you explain 22? Gary spoke on the lacrosse field. He spoke in actions, through every dodge, every shot, every pass. He spoke in ways we understand and in ways we can't. But wherever he went, when Gary Gate stepped on the field and spoke, every entity in this sport listened. If that doesn't make him the chosen one, I don't know what does. In the wake of the Gates leaving, Syracuse would need to completely rebuild its midfield unit, long the powerhouse of the team. Of course, if you're Syracuse and you need an all-world midi, you know exactly who to call. Charlie Lockwood wore the number 7 his entire West Genesee career, and left the program an All-American and State Championship Game MVP. He was set to wear it again at SU when Roy Simmons Jr. approached him. If you have any guts, you'll put down your high school number and pick up this number. So begins the lineage of 22. Lockwood was not alone in midfield. He'd be joined by another high school All-American in Dom Finn. The pair were among the best recruits in the nation, and even if only one got 22, it was clear that they were the choices to fill the void Gary and Paul left. Maracek, given the chance to run the show in 91, was at his very best, becoming the fourth man in Syracuse history to score 50 goals in a season, and Lockwood put up 35 points on the way to being named a third-team All-American. Syracuse topped Hopkins in the quarterfinal to reach the Final Four, but North Carolina handed the Orange their first tournament loss in four years, en route to a national title. In 92, though, it seemed all the right ingredients were coming together again. Maracek was named a first-teamer for the third straight year, and both Lockwood and Finn exploded to first-team selections as well. Freshman midi Roy Colsey, who followed Finn from Yorktown to Syracuse, was named a third-teamer as well. Another midfield powerhouse was taking shape as SU rolled to the championship game. Their opponent was not Hopkins, Cornell, or UNC, but a new player in the national scene. Four years after hiring Hopkins assistant Bill Tierney, the positive momentum built up through multiple tournament appearances finally manifested in 92, when third-seeded Princeton upset UNC to reach Memorial Day for the first time. Meanwhile, Syracuse was in its fourth title game in five years, having won it all their previous three appearances. The underdogs threw the first punch, though, and backed by a relentless defense, kept SU's offense in check. In the end, neither side could find a regulation winner, and we headed to overtime. First to ten, wins it all. Hughes secured the opening faceoff, and Finn isoed up a short stick, spun to his left, then rolled back to lose him. He had the space to let one rip. This was the moment, but Finn's shot careened off the goalie's helmet. The Tigers regained possession, and with neither side caving in, the first overtime period came and went. On a contested faceoff to open double OT, Princeton Mitty Andy Moe scooped up the ball, ran untouched down the alley, and clinched Princeton's first national championship. Tom Maracek left college lacrosse without the third title the Gates had. Much of his hype was shifted to his Canadian compatriots, but by every measure he was nearly as accomplished. He's one of 16 men in NCAA history to score more than 180 goals, the only SU player within miles of Gary. He's the only man in Syracuse history besides Gary to score 20 points in a tournament. 
He remains one of the sport's all-time legends. Without any of the first triumvirate left, a 1-2 start to 1993 raised alarm bells on the hill, but Colsey exploded onto the scene with 28 goals, joining Finn as a first-team All-American. Lockwood fell to a second-teamer for the first time, but still, Colsey's strength, Finn's quickness, and Lockwood's shot combined to create an absolute force. All three midfielders would go on to be named First Team All-Americans multiple times. To have one of those guys in your midfield is phenomenal. Two is special. And three is the second triumvirate of Syracuse lacrosse. Attack Matt Reiter joined in on the fun too, bull rushing his way to a First Team nod in Marichek's place. In the semifinals, Two goal performances from six different players secured revenge over Princeton for SU's 10th straight win. When Syracuse had fallen to UNC to open the season, Ryder told his defender they'd see the Tar Heels in May. Lo and behold, the title game would offer another chance at revenge. Things remained tense well into the fourth quarter, when two Tar Heel goals in 30 seconds promptly wiped SU's lead away. Hughes grabbed the faceoff and wound the clock down while putting pressure on UNC, but Lockwood was called for a crease violation with 30 seconds left, and Carolina's coach chose against using a timeout. On the clear, sophomore Rick Beardsley picked off a pass, and Reggie Thorpe scooped it up to start the last thing the Tar Heels needed, the legendary Syracuse transition. Thorpe, Schmied, Lockwood, Reiter, Redemption. 1994 would not be so kind to Syracuse. Despite continued domination from the midfield, Virginia gave the Orange a taste of their own medicine in the Final Four, eventually finding an overtime winner to deny the second triumvirate a storybook ending. Still, 1993 was enough. In the end, Lockwood, Finn, and Colsey would all make the U.S. Lacrosse Hall of Fame, and when they took the field as a unit, they pieced together one of the greatest midfields in this sport's history. Not too bad for the Gates replacements. Speaking of the Hall, let's go back to 92 for a second. February 8th, 1992. Roy Simmons Sr who himself was inducted in 1964, presents his son to receive the same honor. The elder Simmons had seen Junior transform his program into a dynasty, and watching his son enter immortality reflected that it was the proudest day of his life. Since his retirement, Senior had transitioned into serving the city he loved as a whole, spending multiple terms on the Syracuse Common Council and even a short time as mayor. And of course, he remained a fixture at every Syracuse lacrosse game. He was there for it all. 83, the Gates, the 92 heartbreak, and the 93 triumph. But perhaps the avenue that best revealed Senior was boxing. Senior loved it so much that when Junior was young, he nicknamed him Slugger. And no matter how hard Junior would try to convince you it was a baseball nickname, he knew it was a boxing term. One of Simmons' boxers kept a rosary his mother gave him in his left pocket while he fought. After grabbing a cab following a win at Michigan State, he reached in his pocket and found the rosary was gone. Simmons turned the cab around, convinced a janitor to open the gym again, and found the rosary down on all fours in the sand beneath the ring. That rosary stayed with the fighter for the rest of his life, even during the brutal island invasions of the Pacific War. Decades later, he pulled it out and said a few prayers for old Simmy. On August 20th, 1994, Roy Simmons Sr. passed away at the age of 93. Everything about his story is just so obnoxiously fake. I mean that in the best way possible. The passion that drove him to voluntarily beat up high schoolers and band nerds the fresh-off-the-train origin story of discovering lacrosse by accident and becoming a Hall of Famer anyways, the coaching acumen that helped him succeed in three different sports at the same time, 
the love to see past the prevailing racial barriers of his age, the humble kindness to always be there for someone, no matter what. Nothing about Roy Simmons Sr. belonged to our world. In every sense, he was larger than life. He transcended the limits we set on our own humanity, and instead entered the realm of myth and legend. He was a folk hero. With Lockwood gone, the Orange were tasked not only with finding a new holder of the acclaimed 22, they'd need to start thinking about an eventual Simmons successor, as Junior would turn 60 after the 95 season. Fortunately, they wouldn't have to look very far to find either. 